Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kim Kilpatrick. I'm the, on the board and the Secretary of Braille Literacy Canada. Uh, welcome back. Boy, that was an interesting discussion in the break all about old slates and styli. Um, but we're going to talk about something much more modern now. Uh, I will say my first math tool was an abacus, but uh, Peter Tusk is not going to talk about abacus, I don't think. Um, his uh, title is an instant, um, an instant translation creating printed math output on the Braille Note Touch Plus. I'm just going to introduce Peter Tusik. Um, I had have had the great pleasure of meeting Peter several times when he was working with uh, students here in Ottawa and sitting in on his workshops. He's a wonderful presenter, I will say, and 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 really is a Braille user himself. So he's very passionate as we are about Braille. I'm surprised he didn't join into this lively discussion we were having. Uh, Peter graduated from the University of Illinois at Chicago with a Bachelor of Arts a degree in history. And he's currently the brand ambassador of blindness products for human wear. I, he travels throughout the US and Canada, uh, supporting teachers and students and presenting at state and national conferences. He's presented at, at the conferences of National Federation of the Blind and American Council of the Blind, and also in many other conferences as well. And it's a great um, pleasure for us to welcome Peter here to present for us today. Oh, rock and roll, Kim. Thank you so much. And I will say I was going to jump in, but I was scared that my, so I have two things. One is I'm on a microphone, so I feel like I would have overpowered everybody. Uh, and, and generally when you're on Zoom, that'll happen. I didn't want to do that. And secondly, that music was just captivating me with the, uh, with like all that nice conversation going on. And there's just like some odd uh, ambient techno going on in the background. I was really enjoying that. So I was taking it in. Um, and then also I have, a, I have a four and a half month old here who was letting me know that she too wanted to be on the presentation. So we may hear her uh, at some point, but I appreciate the kind words and I, I love being here. And honestly, the other piece is I'm happy to talk Abacus. Now, the real question there is, and, and I'll give everyone time to think about this because I am going to be talking about math, but it's, uh, it's, it's about methods. So are you a secrets user? or a logic user. And I'll kind of leave that uh, for later discussion. And you maybe you tie that into trivia later on, Natalie. Secrets or logic or counting. Are you a counting method uh, user? All of which I am definitely familiar with uh, having done all kinds of, of abacus and, and braille sorts of pieces uh, growing up. And as Kim said, I am the brand ambassador of blindness products for human wear. Uh, I'm no stranger to Canada, although I miss it. Uh, I have not been on the road for about 15 months and I know uh, I believe it was Mike who was speaking previously, said they closed on uh, March 14th of last year. And that is essentially when I closed um, in terms of being able to be out and about. So I have been home, uh, been presenting all over the place um, and doing all sorts of presentations and pieces, but uh, definitely miss being on the road and kind of having the chance to interact with everybody in person because doing it this way, as great as it is that I can come join you from my house in Chicago, you know, at five o'clock uh, or four o'clock Eastern on a Friday, um, that's very neat, but at the same time, I can't put anything in your hands. It's very hard to have a, uh, a more hands-on demonstration or discussion that we're used to having uh, when things are kind of flowing. But I will share my screen. I do have slides, and again, I'll talk my way through them. Um, for those of you who are light dependent, the slides won't mean something to you. For those of you who are not, like myself, the slides will mean nothing, and that's okay. So I'm going to share my screen here, and we will jump on through. Give me one second. And we'll, we'll really look and talk a lot about math. And I know, again, this will be relevant in different spaces, um, not necessarily something that is going to be relevant to everybody here today, but it will kind of let everyone know what's going on and, and where we stand and also what we need to be working with. So uh, in the future, how are we going to bring this stuff forward? All right, screen is shared and I am going to come over here. And we're going to we're going to look at this from the point of view of kind of just a few slides here and I will be, be if we have time doing a short demonstration in terms of math content what I want to talk about is high tech and low tech I mean the importance of both we there is always going to be a place and I love the segue we were talking about slates um, over the the great music that was on the slate discussion um, and and talking about still using slates and in, in hard copy braille is, is really what that equates to as well and how useful that still is um, 
you know, I work at Humanware. We are very much into technology and I feel we do a great job of leading that sort of being on that cutting edge of technology trends. Um, you know, and, and it is something that, uh, you know, I, I, I believe a ton in and I love <clears throat> the importance of working in that very tech centric environment, but it doesn't mean there isn't room for a Perkins Brailler. It does not mean we overlook the importance of hard copy Braille and the use of Braille all over the place. We certainly believe in branching that into technology and we're going to talk a lot about math and science but when it comes to those subjects when it comes to stem or as a lot of people say now steam right we have to include art um, so it's not just uh, the stem side we're going to include science technology engineering art and math so feel free to say steam i guess is, is what i've learned in the last few months where i was always saying stem um, it does come down to low-tech options and we know especially in art especially when we look at 3 3d printing or some of the pieces that give us tactile information, low tech is is essentially our, our inroad into that sort of space. So using um, a, a piece of paper cut to a certain way or using a clay molded into a model or using something that is just laying around to give us a tactile representation is extremely important. Um, in this first slide, I mean, I talk about high tech, low tech and, and sort of the options for producing Braille. Um, I do have the Perkins Brailler here. I don't have the slate listed because primarily, especially in, in all of the travel I do outside of the adult populations, the slate is still relevant, um, but I don't see it much being taught, unfortunately. Um, but believe me, there are places where I don't see Braille being taught, which is extremely unfortunate. Uh, but the Perkins Brailler is still something that is very relevant. We're going to use it to teach and learn spatial concepts. We're going to use it quite often, especially in that math side of things, um, as a means of, of producing and understanding how problems are solved and laid out. Um, you know, as my, all, all of the fancy tech that I'll be showing, a Braille display is one line. And until we have a nice solid way of, of not it, it, you know, having just a linear product on a refreshable Braille display, we still need to use these pieces when we're building foundations of math and science. I also have the Mount Bat Batten Brailler listed here, and that comes into play as it provides auditory content, but also is great for younger Braille readers or writers uh, because it does require less effort, again, from the, you know, fr from that muscle sort of standpoint. Um, a lot of times we learn in three, four, five-year-old kiddos are pushing with all their might on those Braille keys, and some just don't have the dexterity to do that. So the Mount Batten Brailler also plays a significant role in producing hard copy Braille. And there are, there are other devices out there that, that do that, um, the pieces like the Smart Brailler and others, but it's certainly in there. The other piece I have listed here is, is embosser or Braille translators, with, you know, able to create Braille translated documents and hard copy documents via embossers. Extremely important, especially, again, when we're doing math, we need to be reading that information in hard copy Braille. Um, it's very important that we have access to it. We are able to create Nemeth or UEB math using Braille translation programs like Duxbury or the free uh, Braille translator from APH called Braille Blaster. There are probably some hardcore Braille 2000 fans possibly in here as well, and you can certainly do that there also. Um, but it is something that, that is extremely important. So we want to be utilizing and using hard copy Braille when it comes to math. And we certainly um, support that here at Humanware, not only in the products with the embossers, but also with what we're trying to do behind the scenes and collaborating with companies like Desmos, um, collaborating with, with folks like APH to build new products and really push the boundaries of what we're going to see on hard copy as well as digital refreshable Braille. Um, the final piece here is the Braille Note Touch Plus that I have listed. And again, we, you know, I, I'm always t kind of in that constant push and pull. Um, and I'm always asked the questions about the note taker versus Braille display versus what should we be using. And the, the, the question is, and the, really the answer that it, that it leads to is, it is going to be a very individualized sort of question that we ask ourselves. What are we using and when? Right now I'm using a Braille display to run this slideshow. Um, I could certainly use a note taker to do it. I could certainly use many pieces of technology to efficiently and effectively present visual, visual content, right? The common theme, though, is that I'm using Braille, and Braille is going to be what's what's going to help me do this. When it comes to math and science, we do see a differentiator, and, then the, and it won't always be this way, but a constant differentiator in the ability to create content visually on the note taker, so something like the Braille Note Touch Plus, being able to create visual math output on the fly is something that is very hard to do elsewhere. It's not impossible. There are environments uh, using screen readers where we can create visual math. There are environments using screen readers where we can consume visual math. Uh, but it, it's going to be heavily dependent kind of on those contexts that you find yourself in. So really, 
we are we are trying to create a complete package and we still have work to do but the braille note touch plus does give us the ability to bring that content to our teachers to our sighted peers to uh you know anybody who's cited for our parents to look over our work and give us real-time feedback and that is something that is extremely important which i'll which i'll talk about in terms of key math what is it right so key math is and my slide just totally went crazy so give me two seconds here while i refresh myself um what is key math right so it's really something that we we came up with about four years ago but the ability to tr take that math content and create and go from braille math to that visual perfect sort of print in real time and this is something that as i'm totally blind i've been a braille reader since i was four years old um, i have used braille and, and all the way through school was was a very confident math student until i wasn't and the reason why i wasn't is because i could not keep up anymore um, I was getting to Algebra 2, I was getting into sort of math where my teacher, my, my TVI, my teacher of the visually impaired, was not as confident, and she knew, he, you know, knew what I was writing, was able to translate it, but by the time I got my work back from the math teacher, I was falling behind because I wasn't showing my work and getting real-time feedback. And when we developed key math, our goal was, our first and, and sort of most overarching goal was to be able to create that math in real time so that a parent, a teacher, or a peer could see what that blind kiddo was producing um, in a visual way, kind of in their medium, right? In a printed math output, not just the words. Um, math speak is great, but it is words. We need to be able to show it visually so that a blind kiddo could participate in higher level math in real time. Key math is something we built in. It's directly integrated into keyword. So keyword is our braille first word processor, very similar to how math type is sort of, in, uh, you know, and can be integrated on top of uh, Microsoft Word or the equation editor in Microsoft Word. Um, it's a very similar sort of concept. So the students are creating math kind of documents in the same way that they're creating all other documents in, in other classes. So you're using keyword, but when you're doing math, you are inputting your work into this document as an image or a picture that is going to be easily readable um, and consum consumable to that sighted teacher. When you want to put in math, it's a matter of pressing backspace with M when you are in that keyword document. You are able to push that command. You come into a new blank key math window. You write your math. Every time you press enter, that visual math is generated. Um, so you're, again, you're creating that visual image. This is not just for math. I mean, I, I, obviously it's called key math, but I've worked with many students who are successfully balancing equations in chemistry, um, who are doing other things than just kind of making math per se. Um, and kind of showing that 2x plus 4 equals 8 and sort of solving for x. There are other ways that, that this is being used. Um, when, you know, the student is done kind of creating those images or, or creating those equations, showing their work, you'll press backspace with E. You will export that image and paste it into your document. The nice thing about that is it is a Braille sort of experience, right? When we're in our keyword document, the Braille is there for us to read. But the print, when we share or save or print the document, uh, whether that's into a shared folder in the cloud, whether that's via email, or whether that's printed onto hard copy paper, that document is showing that visual math correctly. So as we kind of walk forward um, and kind of look at what key math is, just a little bit of a deeper dive, we do support, and I know this is very Canadian, so I, I know UEB math is the standard, there might be some old timers um, who are still working with Nemeth code here in the States. We do work with both, both depending on the state you're in. So we do fully support Nemeth code and UEB math. Um, UEB math is, is a matter of, or Nemeth is a matter of, of setting your preference within the key math settings. Um, we also have the symbol selector. And a lot of times this is something and that this has, has been with humanware products for a long time. But if you're unsure of, uh, and my, I, I've, I've done very, good and i'm very fortunate because i work in this sphere right so learning ueb to me even though i did not learn it in school i forced myself to learn it because that's what i was going to need to use especially when i do presentations in other countries i do a lot of pieces for the uk for australia uh, for places where nemeth code isn't being used so i have had to force myself to to learn ueb and, and use ueb and also ueb math and in doing so we have the symbol selector which allows us to look up or refer to uh, a sort of a, a, a place or a, 
the word I'm looking for escapes me, of course, at this exact moment. But it's uh, think of it as a resource that is built in that allows you to search for and correctly determine what various symbols are. So if I'm unsure of the superscript or the subscript or the pi sign, I can come into the symbol selector and I can find what that is. Um, so and then I can input that into my key math sort of uh, equation. So you're able to use it. It's not a teaching tool. It is certainly not a teaching tool, but it is a reference tool uh, that you can use. You're also able to put in templates, and this is very relevant. Actually, I've, I worked with a kiddo in Ontario on this quite a bit uh, prior to my not traveling. You are able to create templates, and you can insert templates into your key math sort of document. For instance, the polynomial equation or some other kind of commonly used templates that you want. If you're reusing something over and over and over, you can drop in a BRF or, or really it's a BRL template into KeyMath and then just fill in what you need to. I make these especially for the sales team, but if you're graphing things and we'll get to graphing in a bit, you might want a template that is sort of a, a circle template or other templates that you can drop and then fill. So it is a very, very sort of niche within a niche there, a very advanced type of feature, but it's something that's used a lot, especially when you're reinserting the same types of equations over and over and over. Um, and, and something that we, we've kept in there. The other piece about KeyMath is it does retain the print image as well as that math braille. So that, again, as I said, when you put that into keyword, you're not losing that braille math for yourself because you are the braille reader, you are the braille user. We want you to read that as you wrote it. You can certainly edit those images later, uh, but we're keeping that braille while at the same time giving that print sort of uh, output there. When it comes to created math, and this is something that, you know, we still have, this is what we really need to clean up. When we, when we developed key math, we did a phenomenal job of bringing key math in. But what we really need to do is we need to find, uh, you know, a, we did a, a great way of creating math content. We did a great way of sort of solved that problem of being able to create math in real time and getting that feedback so that you're not falling behind. Where we fell short and where we are working on, and, and we will see some improvements, is how do we consume math content on the device? So as it currently stands, the teacher or parent or instructor would create math using math type or the equation editor, let's say found in Microsoft Word. The teacher would save that file as a DOCX file and then would open it up or import it, right? Open it using a Braille translator like Duxbury or Braille Blaster. Once opened in the Braille Translator, you could save it as a BRF file. So you would translate it to BRF and save it. And you'll have a Braille document or a BRF file that you can send to your user, to your Touch Plus user. So once you do that, the student would get the document, would open that BRF file using the key BRF application, which is our, our really that, that key BRF application is how um, we would think of it as just working on a raw brailler. It essentially takes what we type and keeps it in raw braille. So you're able to create music. You're able to create math. You're able to take notes in grade three if you're if you're someone who has your, your grade three down um, or you just want to do various types of shorthand or whatever it may be. It's not going to translate into anything. It keeps it in raw braille. So you can open up that document containing the math. You're able to select the equation that you would like. You're able to paste that into key math and then again it will tape it turn it into visual you solve your equations and put them into the document so again that process and it sounds daunting and it can be at first it's very daunting and we need to find a way to better clean that up so that when a student receives a document containing math in it it will be workable and editable and usable straight away in keyword and that's something we're we're very much aware of and we're working on i have created lots of videos that kind of walk us through this process andrew Flatris and I, Andrew's our Braille product manager. Uh, we did a, a webinar on this. If you look at our HumanWare Live channel, which I have a link to later in the presentation, um, on October 15th, I think of last year, we went through all of these steps. How would a student consume this content um, and, and actually turn the math they received in that BRF file into, into print and then solve for those equations? What I have here is a picture of kind of what it looks like um, when you want to create the math. So what happens in Word? How do you put that into Word? Um, and then convert it, right? And once you do convert it, you're gonna be able to then take it in this picture here, will show us kind of what, what it looks like when you open it up in Duxbury, and then what, what happens when you open it like uh, up in key BRF. So again, being able to, to do that, and then the student will put it in, will solve the equations, and the output or the finished product 
is kind of here and this is again the visual printed math appearing alongside literary math such as your heading literary braille that you've typed in the document previously so my name my date um, the topic of the assignment and then boom all of this visual math in there and you can certainly mix sort of literary braille within those images as well so in, in the benefit of this is that the teacher can type comments directly into the document either at the top or the bottom and the student can then go in and edit that work in real time. We've seen this used very successfully throughout the pandemic with remote instruction. It's been a game changer because again, we don't have the ability to get that math ink printed. Um, that just isn't existing right now, although it is in, in many spaces as things open back up. But we've learned a lot about the importance of kind of how we're able to use technology to keep up during these times. And, you know, uh, hopefully we won't get back into these sorts of situations again anytime uh, in any of our lifetimes. Um, I, it's been it's been wild for many students. We've we've had a lot of loss of learning, but at the same time, those who have had access to pieces of technology such as this have been able to keep up during this time, and that's been been a major major difference. Talk about kind of the math breakthrough here, and again, I'm flying through these slides. I know I, I'm not here to sort of. We, we could spend all day on some of this stuff and I, I don't even think I'll, I'll do a live demo just for time's sake and kind of what the time we're working with here. But when it comes to this math, it's not just about creating math type, right? Creating two plus two equals four or the square root of nine equals three. It's not just about inserting fractions or creating that visual output. It's also something, you know, we've worked with Desmos to be able to create graphs and be able to not only create 2 plus 2 equals 4, but also y equals 4x plus 3, and show that we've solved for that graph, you know, and, and create it for our teacher in real time. And our teacher can give us that feedback of what we did. Did we solve for our slope equation, our y equals mx plus b, or did, did we solve sort of those pieces properly? And again, this is a step in the right direction, but we're not done. We need to find, and, and this is still something very challenging, but we need to find a way for a Braille reader to extrapolate the same content that a print reader or, or someone who is cited gets when they look at a graph. And I'm not saying that's easy. Um, there have been many steps and stabs at this. We've seen some really neat things during the pandemic with accessible charts and, and, and you know, uh, COVID numbers and all sorts of things that have been really neat. A lot of the work that, um, that has been done, uh, that, that Penny has done um, with the Weather Watch and other, other pieces, uh, you know, we, we've seen some really neat things uh, in terms of consuming this stuff but we know that that still is another step so we can create graphs we can share them immediately with our teachers we put them into keyword um, you can even emboss them if you have the right embossers but you're still not going to take a scatter plot and perfectly emboss that onto or create that into a tactile graphic you know and this comes back to i i i think this comes up every time i speak but i was in here um during the previous presentation and the whole piece of making something accessible is very different from making that usable. And we hear this all the time. And, and accessibility can be a buzzword, as, as I believe Mike uh, said. And it's, it's very true, right? Okay, this is accessible, but where's the usability aspect of this? And so we are making these graphs. We can create them. But the usability to the end user still leaves something to, uh, you know, something something desired so we want to be able to work with this to work and both create more graphs and cr better create different types of graphs but also get creative with how we can consume those graphs and i can tell you that there are some pieces coming that will be very intriguing when it comes to working with um, that sort of tactile output and, and that side of thing when it comes to math and science again um, you know, we, we do have a method on the device to explore a tactile graph. It is very trippy, if I can use that word here. Um, it's not the cleanest thing when you're looking at a diagonal line on a linear Braille display, but it can be done. And I, we've demonstrated that in various videos and places, but it's something that, uh, that, th that we need to put some more time into when it comes down to the consumption side of things, not just the content creation. So I have a slide here that says, let's see in action. I'm going to skip this slide because I, I was going to come in and do some things. But with the time we have, um, I do have a couple more slides with some important information that I want to get to. And then I certainly can take questions. But I'm going to I'm going to reserve this. Let's see it in action for the next time you find me or track me down and say, Peter, I want to see it in action. Or you can see all of this on pre-recorded webinars as well. So. I do have a link here to key math demonstration videos. This is in slide number 11. This uh, really, we try to create snapshot tutorials, webinars, resources at HumanWare that are useful to everybody. 
I know for a fact, and I know many of you here are blind Braille readers, as I am. We learn differently, right? We can learn things on our own and do all this and kind of take the time to sit down with a full audio tutorial or a full user manual or a full uh, resource guide. A lot of times, though, the teacher, the parent, the peer doesn't have that same type of time. They're not working with these devices at home. Um, they're not using these every day. And something, these, these pieces can be very, very daunting. So we try, myself and, and Andrew, uh, previously Greg Stilson, who was here, who is now at APH, who's a very close friend of mine, started this whole trend years ago to create small, we call them snapshot tutorials, small videos that will illustrate a concept or illustrate a point um, and, and let us, you know, kind of bring um kind of kind of bring things to you in a very short sort of piece of very digestible right so it's three to five minute five to six minute videos we also have other pieces um, that i'll get to in the hw buddy app that are more text-based we also have audio tutorials and all sorts of things but we definitely do have snapshot tutorial videos available for these various pieces we also have webinars um, that we've worked on extensively that are found in and on the support page, so on the Humanware Live page, I'm going to come to the next slide here. And this kind of looks at, again, the, the sort of HW Buddy app, and we'll get into the, the resources, but the HW Buddy app is a means of looking at Humanware, sort of uh, our, our website, all in one place. Um, we're able to, it's on iOS and Android. It gives you an, the ability to come into all of our pre-recorded webinars. It gives you the ability to look at our snapshot tutorial videos, as well as tons of how-to guides. Um, the how-to guides are very text-based and they will let us you know efficiently sort of work through step-by-step -step instructions um, without needing that video side of things so we're trying to create multiple levels of content um, the app is for teachers the app is for tvis you know for parents for everybody we really want that app to be something that you have that is kind of always there for you uh, in your pocket you can pull it out when you need it you can certainly search for keywords and filter by product um, you can always do that sort of thing as well um, and come in and just explore all of the products that are offered in there with the how-to guides and you can share them if you need to or bookmark them further resources so i have a link here to the humanware live webinar series that's a there's a lot of webinars up there that myself and andrew have done we certainly have continued to do them but as things have picked up we have not done as many as we were previously um, it, we were doing two a week at one point went down to one a week now we are doing about one a month but we, we certainly have one coming on Braille displays, but we will kick this back off in the fall with a lot more educational content dealing with math and science. Because we are on the cusp and we are kind of at that beginning stages of looking at how we're going to be changing this key math program to be more efficient when it comes to consuming content. And that is something we've heard a lot of feedback on. The creation's great, the consumption needs to improve. So um, something that we'll be working with, I always appreciate webinar suggestions and ideas. Um, I certainly try to be as informative and, and go as slow as I can when I'm doing these. Um, I know I'm kind of rushing through these slides here today, but really just we're, we're here and we wouldn't be here without feedback and without kind of the, not only listening to teachers and, and kiddos in the classroom, but just listening to what the needs are the, out there um, in terms of what's needed for this type of stuff, for all of this STEAM content. What else do we need to be doing? And there are some things that are deep down being worked on. Um, that are certainly very exciting that I think we'll see in the next while um, that are going to really change the way we consume math and science. Again, the HW Buddy app is listed here as well. Um, and my email address is here, which is peter.tusic, T-U-C-I-C, at humanware.com. You can always email support at humanware.com if you have specific supported questions. If you have product suggestions, you can email info at humanware.com. Um, and certainly, you know, we, we, we want you to be able to reach us and to be as accessible to you as we can be, and certainly to continue to provide materials. Um, I am going to stop <laughs> because I babbled for 29 minutes, so I try to keep myself in my allotted time always. But I certainly want to take questions because I know... That's there may be lots of questions and I really appreciate the invite. So thank you, Natalie. And always, uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar names here. So thank you, Kim. And, and thank you to everybody who is here. Um, and hopefully I'll get to see all of you sooner than later. And that's kind of, you know, our dream, right? It's uh, it is Friday. So I hope everyone has an awesome weekend and I will certainly be here for questions. Thank you so much, Peter. We're going to turn it uh, over to Natalie one more time. We, I think we have a very exciting, uh, door prize to 
Oh, we do, we do. It's one that those of us who have known the secret have been dreaming about for sure. Peter, let me start by thanking you for another great presentation. I'm sure that this is not the last time that BLC will reach out to you um, for these really, really helpful workshops. I feel that even, even just having a workshop on Braille and math and STEAM in the same sentence just helps to kind of push against that idea that these are visual subjects, um, that they're too difficult for blind people to learn and just working towards increasing that inclusion in those fields. So thank you for, for working towards that. No, thank you so much. And I will also say, you know, as we go forward, there's there's more to it. We really want to push the envelope, envelope, that's not a word, the envelope. <laughs> when it comes to coding, when it comes to programming, yes. the, the math and science field is the start to, there are so many jobs. There's such a need for programmers. There's such a need for people in these fields. And there's no reason blind people can't exist in those spaces. And there are many that do, but we need to be able to increase access. And, and we... We know that, so I think you'll continue to see us in this space in, in various ways, whether it's on note takers, whether it's on different types of braille displays, whether it is on you know developing programs that make coding languages and, and other pieces, not that they are not accessible now, but they make them more easy to understand, easy to work with. So I don't, uh, I, I don't think we'll be leaving this, this sort of space anytime soon. And, and we always, we want to push this forward. And so I'm sure you'll be, you'll be hearing from me at some point somewhere. And I'm always, always happy to, to share what I know and, and help anybody kind of with, with any questions. So it's great. Oh, definitely. And I know this is um, definitely an, an area of interest and priority for BLC. So thank you, Peter.